So this thing works. Yes, it does. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So, in uh, fiction, in the 1960s, there was a James Bond uh, episode called From Russia with Love, a very appropriate title, and even better, in the, the, the core of the scenario was about uh, trying to recover a lector. A lector was a, well, Sovietic at the time, not Russian, encryption device. So there is a scene where you have uh, James Bond who is uh, listening to a description of this device. It uses rotors and everything, all this old-fashioned stuff. And you have these guys, cryptographers from MI5 or 6, I never remember. And they are trying to use this information to recover how this lector works. Reality is a bit less impressive. Instead of sending guys overseas and have them listen to pretty KGB agents, you look at a PDF file. And on this PDF file, you have this kind of stuff. So you just look at them and you squint for several months and eventually, hopefully, you get some results. This is Pi, the S-box of the last two Russian standards. So you have a block cipher called Kuznetschik, which means grasshopper, and a hash function called Strebog. Both use the same S-box. It operates on 8 bits, it's a permutation, it's differential and linear properties are fine. They're a bit better than what you would expect from a random permutation on 8 bits. But what we don't know is how it was made. The only thing you need to implement an S-box is its lookup table, and that's the only information that its designers provided. This obviously begs the question of how did they design it. So first, I'm going to uh, give a brief reminder about the things we knew about this S-box uh, up to that point. So <coughs> some results which I have established with uh, my then colleagues from Luxembourg, and also the tiny bits of information provided by the designers and then I'm going to present what I claim to be its actual structure, so the one which its designers used on purpose. And finally, I will explain why I don't like that structure. So in the first place, we found this decomposition of pi. So that's when I was in Luxembourg. I worked on this with Alex Biryukov and Alex Yudovenko, and we managed, using techniques I'm not going to go into, to rewrite this permutation in this way. It's ugly. Uh, let's not beat around the bush. It is very ugly, but it helps with the hardware implementation. So when we ended up with this first decomposition, we were mostly puzzled. Also because this component uh, has the worst differential uniformity you could imagine. Uh, this, yeah. This part, I call it T, this part, I call it U. So in the following, when I talk about the TU decomposition, it's this decomposition. We were not very happy with this decomposition, so we made a bit of a detour. We had a look at an S-box from Belarus and realized that it was built like a logarithm and that it actually looked a lot like the Russian one. And we also established that the Russian one could actually be written like a kind of logarithm, a discrete logarithm, composed with a weird function, a weird permutation, which is extremely weak from a cryptographic standpoint, so it's not something you would expect from a random permutation, but it's really not satisfactory. We knew there was something to be found, but we couldn't find it. So this we published at uh, TOSC also. And in this TOSC paper, we wrote this uh, in our conclusion. So the important parts are in red. We think it more likely that each of these decompositions, so the TU decomposition and the log-based one, um, is a consequence of a strong algebraic structure. Still, this master decomposition from which the other would be consequences remains elusive. And at that time, we thought the only way uh, we could actually recover this decomposition would be if the designers of these algorithms, so basically the Russian secret service, would tell us. The little information they did provide, because uh, they are trying to convince people to standardize these algorithms. So Strebog is already an ISO standard. Uh, Kuznetschik is being considered for standardization by ISO. Both, both of them are RFCs, so their designers do try to advertise them. And in one of uh, such talk, you have one of the designers of Kuznetschik, which explained how they built their S-box. So here you have two uh, successive slides. It's the same, except the second box is in red, which I think means that it's the important part. 
It's about uh, how they built their S-Box. The first box here and here is uh, about a possible way of building S-Boxes by selecting them from known classes. This gives you the best cryptographic uh, properties, so differential uniformity linearity. It has an obvious analytical structure, and you can use, for instance, the finite field inversion, which is indeed a perfectly valid way of building your S-Boxes. That's how they are made in the, in the AES. The second box, which is which turns into red, is about a random search with a given limit on the parameters. It's not clear to me what this limit might be. And such S-boxes do not have optimal properties. They don't have the best differential and linear properties, but they also do not have a pronounced analytical structure, which, again, is true, and people do use such S-boxes uh, for such reasons. So there is nothing wrong here. The part which I personally find quite funny is that they... Um, left out the first option because it has, a, it has an obvious analytical structure and preferred the second one because it does not have a pronounced analytical structure. Well, actually, what I'm going to show it is that it has an extremely pronounced analytical, stru analytical structure. Um, cryptographers have tried to discuss with the designers because they go to conferences sometimes. So um, Marku Johannes Arinen he and uh, his co-author for uh, Worldbob, which was a Caesar candidate based on Stribog. They had a short discussion with the designers of uh, these algorithms, and these, the designers said that they had used some randomization using various building blocks, and that this was seen as an effective countermeasure against yet unknown attacks, which is coherent with the content of the previous slide. At ISO, uh, what they say is that they did not use the TU decomposition to design their algorithm, their S-box, which I think is true, that their aim was to have the best possible and, and linear, the best possible differential and linear properties obtained from some random search, which they do not explain. And they also say that before the SHA-3 competition, we didn't really care about the origin of parameters, and so the Streebog designers didn't care either and so they don't feel too bad, about, too bad about the fact that they lost the generation algorithm. So at that point, they claim to have lost the generation algorithm and that they don't really mind because at the time when they designed it, people didn't really care about the origin of parameters. Uh, this is not true. Even in 1985, people were already designing block ciphers with very careful explanations about their generation process for their S-boxes. So I'm a bit puzzled by this, uh, by this statement. And then at a small workshop called Crossfire, uh, there was a Russian cryptographer that presented uh, Kuznicic. Unfortunately for them, uh, Maria was the session chair and could ask them some questions about uh, their design process. And they avoided the question and eventually said that uh, they had used the two decomposition to design their S-box, which, no, they didn't, I think. So at that point, we have two decompositions which we are not really happy with, and we have some contradictory statements by the designers, and also some really wild statement by the designers, like this is, well, I'm supposed to be polite. So now I'm going to present what I found and we, what I described in, uh, in, the, in this task paper, which is what I think is the actual structure. So before I go into how I found it, uh, just a bit of math, the finite field with two to the two M elements, so there should be only one M, but a two before, can be written in this way, uh, except for zero, so that's just the final feed logarithm. And because of this, you can partition the state in this way, so you take a union for all i's of alpha to the power i, where alpha is a generator of the multiplicative subgroup. This is the multiplication, and uh, then if you put aside the case uh, i equal to zero, which is just the subfield, then you get this uh, description of the, of the final field as a union of vector spaces. But not quite vector spaces, because this don't contain zero, but almost vector spaces. Since the subfield is a vector space of dimension m in a final field of dimension 2m, you can also find another, another subspace uh, of the same dimension, such that uh, the union of the two will span the whole state. So you can also write the final field in this way. So it's going to be the union for all these Ws of the additive coset of the field, of the subfield. And then if you put aside the case where uh, you have the element zero here, you end up with this partition of the state, of the final field. 
What's important is that in both cases, you have partitions with an element, um, yeah, with a set of size two to the m, and two to the m sets of size two to the m minus one, and everything is linear. It's important because that the pi interacts with this uh, partition. First, some words about how I actually found this structure. So for reasons that are completely unrelated to any of this, um, I worked on a, an, an, an algorithm which looks for vector spaces in a set of, uh, of elements. And one nice application of this algorithm is that it can allow you to look for um, spaces of a given dimension that go through a permutation and are mapped to other spaces. So you have an affine space in the input, and when you apply the permutation, you have an affine space in the output. And you can look for all of those. So I was very happy because I thought I had a nice way to test this algorithm because I knew that in pi there was one such transition. If you set this branch to zero, this is a multiplexer which selects the output of this component when this one is equal to zero and this one otherwise. So basically you have that uh, when this guy takes all possible values, here you get a vector space of dimension four and here a vector space of dimension four. So I was expecting to find one such uh, transition. But actually I found two. So I had completely forgotten about uh, this S-box and I had moved on with my life, but I shouldn't have and now I was back working on pi again. And so what I realized is that this uh, second pattern was, uh, could be generalized to look not at really vector spaces, but almost spaces where you have removed the zero. So if you fix a value here, when this guy takes all possible values except zero, you get a vector space at the top because the multiplication by a constant is linear and a vector space at the bottom, well, and a fine space at the bottom. And you have 16 such weird transitions. So this is the situation. We have the finite field, the image of the finite field, which is the finite field itself. And you have one vector space, which is sent to some affine space and another vector space, which is sent to another affine space. So that's what I had found with my algorithm. And the combination of these two space together, they span the whole uh, finite field and you have the same here. When I realized this, I felt really stupid because I had been looking at pi for three years at that point and I knew about uh, like this set and this set, that they existed and interacted with the S-box. And I never realized that they were the subfield. So when I realized that, I like, banged my head on the wall and then worked further. And then I realized that this other vector space in the input was a multiplicative coset of the subfield and in the output you had something which was uh, in direct sum with the subfield. And when you look at the other multiplicative uh, subsets of this, uh, the other multiplicative cosets of the subfield and the additive cosets of the subfield in the output, pi maps one to the other. So pi maps the partition of the field into its multiplicative cosets of the subfield to its partition into additive cosets of the subfield. The random S box pi does this. Actually, you can write it in this way. So that's what I call the TK log because the designers of uh, Kuznicic are the TK26 and it's kind of a logarithm. So you need an affine function uh, and a small permutation of the exponents of the subfield and the generator and then it works like this. I'm not going to go into too much details. Uh, it, map, it always, so such permutations and pi in particular always satisfy some set equalities uh, namely these, but what is important is that it has a kind of separation property. So if you have that your input is in a given multiplicative coset, it will always be in the same additive coset because when you change j here, you change the j here, and so where it only changes where you are in this set. The additive coset doesn't change. At the same time, if you fix a J and you change the multiplicative coset, you will be at the same spot in the additive coset, you will just change the additive coset. If S depended on I somehow, you would still have this coset to coset property. It's not the case. So pi does not just map these uh, multiplicative cosets to additive cosets, it's even simpler. It could do this in a more complicated way, it doesn't. 
Uh, also, we can prove, and I'm not going to go over that, uh, that uh, this TK log structure explains both of the previous decompositions. The relationship between the TU decomposition and this log-based decomposition was extremely unclear to us. Uh, we were really puzzled by this thing. This decomposition explains it. Now, why don't I like this? I'm going to have to tell you about the work of someone else, namely Arnaud Bagnier. <coughs> My apologies. So in his PhD thesis, uh, he introduced a way to introduce uh, backdoors in a block cipher, which was a generalization of previous works by uh, Kenny Patterson on these imprimitive um, uh, S-boxes on the DES that you could put in the DES. And he, what he proved is that um, if you want to have a backdoor where you are, have a partition of the input space into affine spaces and a partition of the output into affine spaces, if you want this partition to be preserved so that two elements in the same VI end up in the same WI all the time, then you had to have this kind of property at the S-box level. So the S-box has to map a partition of the space into affine spaces, subspaces, to a partition of the space into affine subspaces. And if you write it with uh, boxes, like I always do, and always with a T and a U, this is what you need. So if you want to build a backdoor of this specific type, then you need a disk box which looks like this. And in particular, if you write it formally, what it means is that you need to have an S box which maps additive cosets of a subspace to additive cosets of a subspace. So that's what he established. So yeah, what he established is that the S box has to map additive cosets to additive cosets. That's not what we have here. Pi maps multiplicative cosets to additive cosets. But it's not that simple either. Because when you look specifically at Strebog, uh, the linear layer interacts with both additive cosets and multiplicative cosets of the subfield. So that's something else the designers did not explain. Uh, when they designed Strebog, they have a small internal block cipher, and this internal block cipher uses a mixed column like operation. And it's specified by its binary matrix. So, matrix. so this is uh, the specification. If you write the binary matrix as a picture, this is what you get. And there are some obvious patterns here. Uh, it's actually just an 8 by 8 matrix of the subfield. Why they didn't say so, I don't know. Because there is nothing wrong with that. What's funnier is that it's defined in the same field with the same polynomial as pi. So if you take a vector of this shape, you just have one element, x, which is in the subfield, and everything else is equal to 0. When you apply this uh, binary matrix to the vector, you get elements that are going to iterate through uh, multiplicative cosets of the subfield. So if x is in the subfield and is going looping over the subfield, each cell of the output vector after multiplication by this matrix are going to iterate over multiplicative cosets of the subfield. So two open problems, uh, pretty obvious ones. First, uh, how was L built? It's MDS, but what else can we say? I mean, like this guy is equal to this guy, and this guy is equal to this, this guy. Can this tell us how, what kind of structure it has? And obviously, can we leverage these properties to actually attack Strebog? Sorry. Or uh, in the case, or also Kuznicic. So in the case of Kuznicic, you also have a similar uh, situation, except they were kind enough to actually provide the matrix in this case, and it's a different uh, polynomial that defines the field. So you don't have this kind of stuff in Kuznicic. But you still have the same S-box with the same uh, very strong algebraic uh, structure, which is supposed to be random. So some natural questions that you may ask yourselves uh, after seeing this. Uh, that's one I get asked a lot, actually. Isn't it always possible to find a decomposition of a permutation? Well, the answer is simple, it's no. If you generate a permutation at random and you give it to me, I won't be able to say anything other than that it looks random. If we can actually find a structure, it's really a strong indication that the design process was not random. Uh, is there anything wrong with <coughs> uh, log-based S-boxes because other people use them? There's nothing wrong with using a logarithm, but that's not what's happening here. It's not just a logarithm. It's a logarithm which maps the field to itself. 
not to the integers. It can be seen as the composition of a logarithm and then something which sends back the integers over the finite field. And also in the case of Strebog, it interacts in a very non-trivial way uh, with the linear layer. So that's why I don't like it. And why would, I mean, this is the third decomposition we have. Like, why won't there be a fourth or a fifth one at some point? To answer this one, I need to do some combinatorics. So you have uh, 2 to the 1,684, roughly, 8-bit permutations. You have 2 to the 83 TK logs. And to put this number into perspective, you have about 2 to the 70 affine permutations. So if someone were to give you uh, an affine permutation and tell you that they had generated it using a random permutation generator, you would probably not believe them and believe that there is some sort of bias into their uh, generation algorithm. It's the same here. That's why I claim that the presence of this structure was deliberate. And that's what the designers actually intended. If you want to design an S-box with properties that are really similar to pi, the generation algorithm is very simple. You just pick a TK log at random. You check if its linearity and differential uniformity are the best possible for a TK log. If it's the case, then you output it and you're happy. If not, you generate another. It finishes pretty quickly. You just need to generate about uh, 2 to the power 11 uh, random TK logs, and you will find one. However, so while the result, so the result of such an algorithm will really look like pi. However, it's never better than a regular logarithm. So if you just take a plain discrete log, the differential uniformity and linearity will be the same, and you will actually have fewer of these uh, coefficients in the DDTLAT. So it's a, an epsilon better. Pi is an epsilon worse than a discrete log. So the reason to use a TK log instead of a logarithm is not an improvement of the cryptographic properties. And so in conclusion, so if you want to convince uh, your friends that, I mean, if you want to talk about uh, the decomposition of this S-box with your friends who might not be cryptographers, I have written uh, a note where I intended to vulgarize this result. So it's at, uh, at this address. I claim that the tk structure in Pi, and I hope I have convinced you, was a deliberate choice by its designers. That's what they intended to do. Why, I don't know, but that's what they intended to do. And it really looks like a structure which is known to yell the backdoor. I have not found an attack against Treebog using this property. To be clear, I have not found such an attack. I'm not saying there is none. I have not found it. However, until the designers of Tribog and Kuznicic explained properly how their random generation process could output an S-box mapping cosets of the subfield to cosets of the subfield in the same field as the one used to build the linear layer of their hash function, and why that might be a good thing, I don't think we should use these algorithms, and I don't think we should standardize them. I'm looking at ISO when I'm saying this, like representatives of ISO, I know that next week they're going to discuss standardizing Kuznicic. I think it's a horrible idea. Thank you. Questions or comments? Yes. <coughs> Here. Pierre. Thank you. Uh, do you think there's something to learn about invariance, more variants of invariant subspace attacks exploiting these kind of properties? Uh, if I were to try to exploit these properties, that's the way I would go, yes. It's really reminiscent of these invariant properties. But, but this kind of partition is typically, I mean, it doesn't remind me of any of the, for instance, of the attacks that Gregor presented on Monday, so that it might be a new variant or? Yes. Okay. That's okay. the way I see it. Thanks. I agree. Thank you for your talk. Um, you indicated that it's easy to find the one with the best differential linear properties in this space. How did you find the bound for this? Experimentally. Uh, maybe there is a way to really obtain them with the proper pencil paper argument. I didn't do that. I generated a lot, and I saw that they could not uh, improve uh, the bounds. Uh, 
actually have my experimental results uh, here. So this is uh, not just the di uh, differential uniformity and linearity, it's a bit finer grained. So the higher you get on, uh, on this axis, the higher you go, the least likely your uh, linear properties are, and in particular, the lower your, uh, lin uh, yeah, the lower your linearity is, the higher you go. It's a bit finer grained because it also counts the number of occurrences of this maximum coefficient. And here is the same for the differential uniformity. So when you generate TK logs, you usually end up in here, uh, under my pointer here, and you have some uh, cases where, uh, which correspond to about one thousandth of them, which end up around this spot. But you would need to go much higher than this to get something with a lower nonlinear, with a lower linearity, and much further to get something with a lower uh, differential uniformity. So maybe there is like uh, one specific combination of uh, the, these two components, so the S and the kappa that you need to define the TK log. Maybe there is one specific instance which will lower these quantities, but using just random uh, um, a randomized search, you're not going to find them. Any other question or comment to Leo? <coughs> okay, if not, let's thanks Leo again.